Well, I've always thought of cinema as a communal experience, and that includes the annoying people who are telling their 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 date the plot and getting it yeah. wrong. Yes, and the senior citizens. Yes, um, <laughs> every Monday. That, that, that's sad, but but yes, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, where, where I watch, um, because a lot of senior citizens watch the movies there. Within ten minutes, someone they're asleep. Now, so yeah. I have the whole screening room to myself, and of course, you know the the usual assholes, the phone rings. Yeah, the, exactly. Nasa cine ko. Yeah. Yeah. Maganda naman! <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time. Bolisay is a film critic and teacher. His first book, Break It To Me Gently, is available online. Richard, thanks very much for coming. Thank you, too. So, first question is, what's the difference between film criticism and a film review? Film reviews uh, are uh, often presume an audience that haven't seen the film. Okay. So, more often than not, the language is very accessible very understandable and it really encourages the audience to see the film. That's what I used to do. Yes. I used to I used to write a lot of film reviews because I had to write the column three times a week. Yeah. And movie film reviews were the easiest to get yeah. going. So the writer has a tendency to comment on specific aspects of the of the film. Cinematography, Correct. acting. Yeah, because um, everyone just wants to know should I spend yeah. my money on this movie? Yes. Yeah. So it's more of la a very accessible language that everyone can understand. On the other hand, film criticism assumes an audience that has already seen the film. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the writer doesn't really have to delve on the summary, you know, like details about the plot, etc. Because, you know, the reader is assumed to have seen the film. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he can start discussing more of the social political aspect, more of the deeper aspects of the film. Ah, kumbaga, film review you read before watching the movie, yes. and film criticism after, when you have chewed over the entire filmography yeah, of the director. Yeah, and somehow, like, Film criticism tends to extend to other discussions. So, it, for example, if you you know if you've seen something that's related to social current events, you know the film critic can do that as well. So, I think uh, in terms of uh, you know audience, film criticism is freer, although limited, because not everyone would like to read something too deep maybe or too complex. Serious and yeah, with, with a lot of terms. Yeah, or sometimes too academic. Mm. But then again, you know, it can overlap yeah. in a way that, you know, film criticism can also be understandable, be accessible. And, you know, I think it, there shouldn't be any hierarchy between the two mm -hmm. because both have their own functions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a common moviegoer would just like to see a movie on the day and they would tend to just go online and see what has been written about the film. I think film reviews function very well in that matter because you know they did know what they want to see, what they might be seeing. On the other hand, if someone like you know felt confused about the film, you know like they want to learn more about the film, like mm -hmm. it's seen like Inception or something right. like Christopher Nolan film or Joker, you know you'd like to learn about it more from other people. Yeah, Inception, which. Um our stylist Jay watched with me, and in the middle of the movie, he yelled at the screen, Echocera! <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, can we offer you a drink? Water and coke, please. Okay, but not mixed. Yeah, okay. not mixed. Um, not gamba, mixed. please. And my tea, please. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I guess one thing that we have in common, uh, whether one is a film reviewer or a film critic, is. Um, I don't like these um, purported film reviews or film criticism na. I like it. It's nice. <laughs> the actress is very pretty. It's like, what's that? Yeah. Diba? I think that's what they do on Twitter now. Yes. Especially like, it's a very short form 
platform and mm-hmm. people are quite encouraged to do like very micro criticism. But they, you know, there's nothing to prevent you from yeah, of course. from having 10 tweets about the yes. same movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, like technology or even like social media is somehow keeping up with all these things. Like, I feel bad that, you know, long form blogging is no longer popular. Yeah, you, you mentioned that in your yeah. book. Yeah, so that, there was a time um, in the mid 2000s when everyone with, was just... With Lilok Pili. Yeah. yeah. And it was so easy to like write long form. You mm-hmm. confess your feelings, you know, you share your thoughts on the film. Now, because of Facebook and Twitter, you know, people are quite, you know, uh, limited. Yeah, and you have to keep the ideas very short. And how do you do yeah. that? Yeah, and it... people don't like to read long things these days. I know. know. Like, they, they'd rather, like, know, like, read a tweet about the film right, than read, like, a blog about yeah, it. Yeah, so your your entire opinion of the movie is in, what, 160 characters yeah, or something? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I feel like it's also a disservice to the film, you know. Like yeah, it, it... and you know, um, so it's not just um, writing about film, but in the last 10 years, I mean, do you, do you ever feel old realizing how much has changed? Like, I miss the Quiapo Cinematheque where yeah. you could go and buy DVDs. Yeah. I know. Like, even up to now, I resist, I've resisted Netflix. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's hard for me to watch films at home because I tend to get distracted. Yes. I have to pause me it, too, yes. go to the fridge, look for something I'm not really looking for. Yeah, and then, you know, <laughs> my cats want to play. So. That's why I still go to the cinema. And mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to impart that habit to my students because they really grew up with, you know, like torrent, with, with laptops and yes. Netflix. And it's difficult to impart them that I saw Lord of the Rings at the cinema. Yes. And it's one of the biggest, you know, most majestic experiences of my life. Yes, and, and, and the thing is, um, I guess other other factors uh, prevent us from going to the cinema, like the traffic being a hostage situation. Yeah, the cost. And the cost, because I remember when the movies were like 20 bucks, and yeah. now 300 pesos, 300. that doesn't include the popcorn. Popcorn and your date, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then again, I think, you know, the landscape is changing. We have all these things like Netflix, like streaming, etc. And it's becoming more difficult for filmmakers to screen their films. Yes. It's very limited. That's why mm-hmm. we have micro cinemas around. But even micro cinemas are, are limited, you know. But kudos to the micro cinemas because they are really um, filling a void. Also, uh, it, it allows people to discuss. Yes. Because I think what capitalism did to us is it destroyed this cine- this this standalone cinemas and replaced them with malls cineplexes with cineplexes yes. and then where you no know, you go see a movie you eat you do everything in the mall the, and, and the point being while you're an, after you watch a movie you go and buy merchandise yes exactly and you know they forget about the value of the film you know mm-hmm. whether it's commercial or art cinema you know every every film merits a kind of discussion well i've always thought of cinema as a communal experience and that includes the annoying people who are telling their 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 date the plot and getting it yeah. wrong. Yes, and the senior citizens. Yes, um, <laughs> every Monday. That, that, that's sad, but but yes, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, where, where I watch um, because a lot of senior citizens watch the movies there. Within ten minutes, someone they're asleep. Now, so yeah. I have the whole screening room to myself, and then there are also the people who. After a line is uttered on screen, have to repeat, repeat it. it. Yeah. Why? I know. I know. And of course, you know the the usual assholes. The phone rings. Yeah, and, exactly. Nasa cine ko. Yeah. Maganda naman. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last time. Like I was, very, I'm very distracted by by phone lights. Yes. He would really make it a point to dim the lights, but still, it's still, you know, I can still see the lights. And mm-hmm. we would tap him, he, the person would still continue doing it. They, they just don't get it. I, I think we need some sort of etiquette. I don't know, like orientation. Although these yes. things shouldn't be taught, but then again, some people I understand didn't have that privilege we have of going to the cinema like every week, monthly, and all. So, um, one of the movie talking points of the later half of this year has yeah. been Martin Scorsese's criticism of Marvel movies. Yeah. Speaking of capitalism. Exactly. <laughs> now, um, full disclaimer: I love Marvel movies. Um, on the first day, I'm usually there to watch them, yeah. and I need Marvel movies to cheer myself up because yeah. the world is a depressing place. Yeah. And yet, I agree with Martin, <laughs> Martin Scorsese that, well, this is not what I think of a cinema. Yeah. It's more like video games, more yeah. like yeah, what theme, is parks, theme parks, and more like you know, um, yeah. the comic books that I read in childhood. They're suddenly you know yeah. on screen there. Yeah. I think it's really the mob culture that really like 
try to like misinterpret what he said. I don't think he's invalidating other people's experience. Yes, and I think and he was very careful to note that, you know, very talented people made this and yeah. did what they could under yeah. the strictures of yeah. selling. Exactly. Yeah. Like I think that was a very good essay he wrote for the New York Times. Yeah, so and if, the, if people bothered to read it well, Yeah, to actually understand what he's talking about. I, I tweeted something about I think it was during the time of Avengers Endgame where mm-hmm. all the cinemas are showing Endgame. Of course. And I think it's really a problem. It's a yes. huge, huge problem. Yes, that... and even I, who saw Endgame more than once, is in, why have I no more option? And there are even like midnight screenings of Endgame. So we, we have a lot of opportunities for these kinds of films. Yes. And it's killing other industries. No, like... but that, that's the thing. Um, now, usually, um, one theater, uh, one movie a week lords it over all the cinemas. As in, you'd have to really go out of your way if you want to watch anything else. Yeah. For example, if you're an independent filmmaker, a small filmmaker who just wants to make your film, you know, you won't be able to make your film because the structures, you know, the industries are getting killed because the distributors won't allow you to show your film. You know, that's exactly. the problem. I think it's what Martin Scorsese is addressing is this huge capitalist problem where films are made, manufactured yes. for, for people and other people don't get that opportunity and in the process we have this homogeneous you know kind exactly. of cinema yeah, where it's, well basically it's a monopoly it's not a good thing it's losing that cultural aspect you know i'm not saying that there's no culture in marvel movies you know everything is you know made of culture but yes. then again if there's just one thing exactly you know there's something wrong with that what do you teach in up i have classes in film theory and criticism so i teach what's undergrad. film theory well it's difficult to define but it's it's a way of interpreting and reading a film. So there are a lot of ways of reading a film. So for example, in the lens of ideology, of feminism. It's a way of like uh, interpreting a film uh, beyond the surface. So outside mm. the aesthetics. Because we are, you know, we are groomed to see films based on good or bad. So that's aesthetics. So would you agree that a lot of film criticism is it's more like literary criticism? As in it's it's analyzing the words you know, the, yeah. the script rather than the moving image. I think, yeah. is there a way to make it focused on the moving image, the, 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 the sound, the visuals yeah, rather than the... It can be. Like on the first day of my class, I shared them this essay by Susan Sontag called Against Interpretation. Yeah. And it talks about how we should, you know, somehow focus on the formal aspects of the film. Yes. Right? The camera angles, the movement of, you know, the shots, etc. And I think it's very important because it's what makes film you know, unique as an art form. And, you know, in the 50s, in the 60s, they're finding ways to legitimize film. Yes. So what makes film different from literature, from mm-hmm. music, etc. Yes. And it's the moving image. It's the, you know, this projection of an image, the presence of an absence, you know, like cinema is not really there, but you're watching it. I tell my students, like, the form is as important as the content. So what the movie is saying is as important as how it's told. Although you have films like Tarantino or Kubrick where the form is, you know, like more emphasized. So when you see this film, the formal elements are much more, you know, accent, accentuated. So there are different ways of, you know, reading a film. So it's not just the script, it's not just the formal elements. So it's not just semiotics or, you know, ideology. Uh, I feel like this subject is very heavy for them yes. because they're used to production classes. Mm-hmm. But I tell them to be a good filmmaker. You have to know these things. You yes. Know? And you have to watch films because watching is education in itself. Yes. So when you see a film by Kurosawa, you know, like you're introduced to a different kind of storytelling if you see Rashomon, Seven Samurai. And obviously a whole different culture. Yeah. With a cool armor, yeah. yeah. Although like I remember like when, when Kurosawa received the Oscar, it was like Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg who like you know, like welcomed him because they're very much influenced by his movies. Yes, and one of the <laughs> pleasures of watching a lot of movies is that, you know, when you watch something like Star Wars, hey, this is like Kurosawa. And Hidden Fortress. The link. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. And I, I actually told my students that, and they're very surprised. Like, yeah, you see the connections. It's like, why is Lang Diaz doing this to me? And then you watch a Bella Tar movie. movie. Oh. oh. <laughs> also, like, I encourage them to watch subtitle movies. You should get used to like foreign language movies. And which is where um, the problems of writers and the problems of filmmakers come together. <laughs> see, ayo magbasa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
probably one of my favorite films this year is Parasite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Korean movie. And yes. like I, I convinced him and to that, see that it. Was, uh, that was a hit here yes. in the theater series. Yes, I remember like when I saw, I saw it twice. When I saw it for the first time, like the theater was quite full. I also attribute to, you know, all the Korean novellas <laughs> yes. and, and, and K-pop. Yes. And the fact that men are now okay with wearing makeup because BTS does. Yes. Right? So. And I think what's very good about that popular kind of cinema is that it also allows you to see these films by, you know, like Park Chan Wook, Bong Joon Ho, who yes. have been making films for for so long and it was their time now to like show something so accessible like Parasite is very accessible but it's also very you know uh, conscious of its critique of a society you know um, I'll tell you a horrible story in my generation a lot of Pinoy's did not watch Tagalog movies being under the impression that is um because it's in Tagalog it's for the maids yeah. As it, seriously, until Sharon Cuneta started making movies, yeah. a lot of Pinoy's did not go to watch Filipino movies. Yeah. But then, you know, they, they got used to it. So, if I had no idea about Filipino movies and I wanted to get to know Filipino movies, where should I start? As in, what would be the essentials? Well, I think the basic is really the mainstream movies. So, if you're into like star cinema movies or regal movies, regal movies, I think that's a good place to start because mm -hmm. they're quite accessible. Like, I'm not the type of critic or teacher who shies away from commercial cinema yeah. because I think that still reflects a lot of Filipino culture. And I think if you're more adventurous and would, would, you li would, li would like to learn deeper about Philippine cinema, you'd go with the basics, bro, ha, Bernal. Yes. And then if you're, you know, you're not happy about what you're seeing, you can go to like Celso at Castillo, Mario O'Hara, you know. I think it's a good, you know, process of like learning because there's a lot of things to, to learn about Philippine cinema. And even now, like, they're, they're always claiming that's the third golden age, you know, like the time in the mid 2000s when we have this digital technology allowing filmmakers to make films. Uh, I think there's so much films to see. But then the problem is not, is that there are very few people chronicling them, writing about the movies, you know, like writing reviews, writing criticism. And I feel like there's this huge gap between the films we produced and the things that have been re written about them. Yeah. And there's not a lot of books to read about, about films. I think that part of the reason why I released the book is that I want to like bottle that time where I when I wrote them and like when I see this book I when I read them now I know it's no longer me like I no longer write that way mm -hmm. I can never write again that way because I started out I don't know many people I didn't know many people and I'm really that bitch who like you know shits on films yes and I don't know them you know mm -hmm. I, ha I have no qualms about but now them. they're your friends now, they're, now I know them <laughs> that's why I cannot write this way again that's why I put them out I started a blog in 2007 closed it down in 2017 17, so it's like 10 years of writing and part of the process is like sifting through this like 500, 600 blog entries. I, and kind of meeting the old you. I know and cringing, <laughs> cringing upon seeing the old me, you know. But then again, you know, uh, I think it's part of the process and what remains is like this 10%, very, very few pieces that I feel, you know, a bit proud of, you know, that I can share. Because, you know, writing is also being, a, you know, being a writer is also being a historian. Nothing. And thank you for pointing out that the writer is not, does not stay static. Yeah. Because um, to this day, you know, people will say, now, you know, I used to write, I used to read your, your column. Why don't you write like that anymore? And I always say, <laughs> You have 10 seconds to get out of my sight. <laughs> 10, 9, 8. <laughs> because what? They, they want you to stay the same in yeah. a box, not aging, yeah. not getting a life. So. Yeah. I think they have this image of you that mm -hmm. you know, they, they want to keep. But yes. then also, like, I also get comments like, why are you not writing? And I feel like, uh, because they don't pay me. Like, there's <laughs> nothing that sustains my Which writing. Which is another truth that writers don't talk about. Yeah. We don't, you know, I feel like our passion for the writing is being used against us. Exactly. Uh, like, like um, you love your work, no money. Why do I have to pay you for it? What? I my know. cats need to eat. And you also imagine the feeling where you have to follow up on your checks, you know? Yeah, tapos <laughs> sila na yung utang pero ikaw yung nahihiya. I know. Mm -hmm. yes. And whenever I talk to young, to like young writers, you know, you need to get paid for what you do because it's your worth. Right. And it's not even the poverty that I don't like. It's like this whole culture that, you know, devalues writing. Exactly. But anyway, we're talking about Filipino movies. So yeah. um, if one wanted to dig deeper, you know, um, what would be the, the essentials? I would say go look for Celso Ad Castillo movies. Yeah. 
those things are bonkers and yeah. brilliant. Because he only made two kinds of movies. <laughs> Genius and garbage. So. <laughs> exactly. I'm a big fan of Bernal. Mm-hmm. Ishmael Bernal. Of course, yes. So I feel like, uh, you know, between that, you know, that dichotomy of Brock and Bernal, Bernal it was often at a disadvantage because you know, yeah. uh, Broca has made, you know, made many less mga konaluanag in fact. Yeah, and, and, uh, and everybody gives more weight to social relevance. Yeah, yes. I think mm-hmm. it is this whole tradition of valuing realism. But then yes. again, uh, Bernal made Salawahan, Working mm-hmm. Girls, you know, which are some of my favorite movies. And I feel like uh, the problem with foreign film festivals now is they're still stuck with the idea of the Philippines being poor. Yes. While it's true, obviously, yes. uh, I don't think we're making the same movies. They're still looking for the broca, for mm. like the Brillante Mendoza kinds of films. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I'm happy when, you know, Love Diaz, you know, became popular in the international circuit because it allowed them to see that we can also be philosophical. You know? Yes. We can also we can make films about the middle class, about right. suffering, etc. It's I have nothing against poverty movies. It's mm-hmm. more of this idea of boxing a culture. Yes. Just in just putting that, us in a neatly classifiable box. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like that's what Bernal did during his time in a way. Like one of the many directors who did it in a way that you know, like I, I just saw Working Girls recently at a festival, and mm-hmm. I feel like it's still very relevant. Like you see Makati in 1984. And you see Makati at present, it's still a place where people like hustle, yes. you know, to make a living. Yes, and on another note, you know, you watch a Bernal movie like Relation and... <laughs> broken Marriage. Or Broken Marriage, where Vilma is working as a guide at the planetarium. Wow, wow. at the planetarium! <laughs> exactly. I think that's what good about films. You see these actual places, you Yes. Know? You see CCP, you know? Yeah, and, and people having a cultural life, because, you know, you, you yeah. watch Ikaway Akin, where they went to watch movies I love in it. Gurti Institute. Like, I know, wow. <laughs> and Nora, Nora like you know cuts orchids yes. at the end, and mm-hmm. they're just looking at each other for seven minutes. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of festivals. So like yes. you said earlier, there's the yeah, are, are they are they helpful? Uh, think? I think at some point they have been. Uh, I think that's why it's important to innovate at some point. Somehow, like you know. Find another way to like present the films. Oh, or, hindi like, na lang puro festival. Oh, hindi na lang yung mga tipong dadalin mo lang yung mga award-winning films from other countries. There has to be some sort of structure or program. Yeah, as in, makikita sila in other festivals, but the local audience can't see them anyway yeah. because the theaters don't want to put them there. Yeah. On one hand, I appreciate festivals because they give you opportunities to see these kinds of films. On the other hand, yeah, I, also... I know plenty of extremely well-traveled, unemployed filmmakers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, it's also seemingly acting like studios as well. So like, I feel like the films produced by Cinemalaya over time uh, have become quite similar. Yeah, because already. it's very Pinoy na, how do we get in? And then they'll work out a formula. Yeah. And if it became successful, like that thing called the Then Nana. it becomes Lechong Manok. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it has to be made again. Yes. So something like, for example, General Luna made a lot of money. Yeah. And Goyo did not. <laughs> so, ah, you know. so where are they now? Oh. <laughs> yeah. So somehow, like, you know, there's really no formula for it. Yeah. Um, the problem, not with the movie itself, but the fact that everyone that followed it tried to be like that. Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't really move. Well, recently I saw Sila Sila I saw by Gian well. Abraham. Abraham. And, <laughs> and, 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 and because of the, the, the age gap, obviously, first I watched it as anthropology, like, so this is what you kids are yeah. doing now. I remember seeing it, like, obviously it has a very specific niche of gay you know culture mm-hmm. using grinder and like some of the some of the people older people i was watching the film with they didn't really get the whole grinder mm. thing so parang, you know obviously mayong may specific siyang audience who would have thought a gay rom-com yeah uh, meanwhile you know back in the <laughs> 90s I would watch a movie where occasionally, you know, two guys would kiss and you would hear in the audience somebody going, Eee! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I think their idea of gay is often, you know, boxed with Roderick Paulate, Dolphy. But I think now there are different nuances of LGBT stories. Right. Maybe. I'm quite happy where Philippine cinema is right now. Mm-hmm. Because one, it has a lot of things it's doing, like production of films. Two, it's embracing its contradictions. It's difficult to make films, but we're still making them nevertheless. You know, like, we're, we're risking a lot. Three, we have a lot of audiences. They just have to be tapped. Yes. They have to be encouraged to go see, you know, 
see these films. But then again, the interest is already there. Like you'd be surprised when I, you know, when I launched my book. Like there's a long line of people, and I was really surprised because you know who the hell, who the hell am I? Yes. So, but then again, you know, that's one of my advocacies right now to persuade people that criticism is not actually destroying films. Well, yeah, because you know, periodically some. Um, Filmmaker who's received a bad review goes on a Twitter rant yeah. and, said, and accuses the critics of destroying I his know. movie. Very familiar. But mm. how can a critic destroy your movie? You know, it's already made. And the critic can only wish to have that much power. Yeah. And how come you think a critic can do that? You know, like so powerful. But then again, you know, we have to reframe our idea of criticism. Criticism is meant to be constructive. And I yes. think people should embrace it more to, to contribute to like the, the production of, of movies. Well, and so, um, our theme is how to maintain your sanity in bonkers times. And um, I've always looked upon movies as my san sanity maintenance device. So, during bad times, do you ever, you know, pull out the, 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 the movies that cheer you up or that bring yeah. a kind of order to the chaos? One of my favorite films of all time is a film called Chungking Express mm. by Wong Kar Wai. We're on top of everything. They're so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. like Fei Wong, Tony Liu. So Don't I, look at Takeshi Kanishiro. I know. He's <laughs> yours. <laughs> but yeah, it's one of my favorite films because, you know, it's, it, it's light, it's cheerful, you know, it's somehow heartwarming, the songs, etc. So I also like Clueless a lot. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, like these are films that are very popular yet you know, they stand the test of time, you know, they speak about their time and they're fronted by very good looking actors. Oh my god, I just remember what's his name? Ant Man. Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd, yes. <laughs> in, in in Clueless, no? So uh Because as you know he doesn't age. Yeah. I know. And note how we're talking to a film critic and I'm like so what movies do you, what are your comfort <laughs> movies? And he's not going, oh, um, the, the, the goalie's anxiety at the penalty kick. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that. <laughs> also, I think I remember seeing recently the one, the Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts film. Uh, Nothing Hill? Nothing Hill. You only, you saw it for no, the No, 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 I saw it again and I felt like, okay, maybe it needs a rewatch and it still works for me. Yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, what else? How about you? What, what's um what's comfort on? movies? I, I I like to watch a lot of old black and white movies. You know, the more Preston Sturges. Oh. Uh, was this um the Palm Beach Story? Okay. Stuff like that. <laughs> and, you know, and also of course Notting Hill for weddings and funeral. Yeah. yeah. Those those things are very comforting. Naalala ko na panat ko recently bringing up Baby. Uh, oh yeah, Ross. with Carrie Grant. Yes. Yeah, and, and it's like that, so um, refreshing. Leopard. Yeah. That's that's what I tell my students. You need to see these old films because you. You'd be surprised how you know advanced they are during their time. Yeah. You need to go back to these masters in a way that you know you, you will learn a lot from them. Like even Kubrick, no? Parang recently ko alang na lamang na parang many of his films are set in in the UK because for some reason in the US he couldn't shoot the films the way he wanted. My God, <laughs> diba? the requirements he he had to you know to shoot his films. No? Yeah, and who would? Well, a lot of people are aspiring to be Kubrick, like I know. Christopher Nolan. I know. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, oh, parang good luck. <laughs> and ano nga, yung parang um, tough job that guy did who had to follow up The Shining with that Dr. Know. Sleep, which I missed. I haven't seen. Yeah. I haven't seen so, as well. It, it takes a, a kind of courage to wade into. <laughs> I know. Even a film like Joker, they said that, you know, it, it alludes to like the success era, the, the, the taxi driver. So it's something that, you know, many of the filmmakers now are like, you know, looking into like, previous filmmakers works as inspiration very good how do you intend to stay sane for the rest of the year <laughs> uh, I think after the semester I will you know get a lot of sleep because mm -hmm. I've not been you know I've been doing a lot of work so I feel like you know I, now as a teacher I'm becoming more involved with actual film work mm -hmm. rather than before you know I just do it whenever I'm free which I like you know you enjoy what you're doing but I'm also in the process of hopefully writing my second book. Mm, which... We're looking forward to that. I forgot to ask you, why is the title of your book Break It To Me, Jen? Oh yeah, good which, question. you know, to us old people, yeah. it's not a song from the 80s. Yeah. Yes, it alludes to, you know, the, the Angela Bofield song called Break It To Me Gently. So somehow, like, as a pop culture person, I'm really drawn to this, you know, kind of titles that somehow, like the Pauline Kael, you know, titles, I lost it I in lost the movies. I lost it in the movies, yes. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. So somehow, I feel like criticism should be something that's not but, you know, distant you yes. know, from, from the common, from the public. And in a way, you know, Break It To Me Gently is my way of saying that 
you know, there are films that you have to break to people gently. You know, yes. your opinion of them. And I feel like that's one way of bridging that gap between the seemingly intellectual critic and like the audience who often feels like they're not good enough to tell their opinion about the movie. Which reminds me because the tentative title for the second book is called This Time I'll Be Sweeter. So okay, so <laughs> this is a series. Yeah.